Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining me for this presentation on the Wood Solutions Technical Design Guide number 50 launch. My name is Adam Jones. I'm a structural engineer with Wood Solutions Midrise Advisory Partnership and also a host of the Wood Solutions Timber Talks podcast. So before we get into the presentation, if you haven't come across Wood Solutions before, we're funded by Forest Wood Products Australia, independent and non-commercial. We basically exist to help you go out there and design with timber in any way we can. Uh, the way we do that is through Wood Solutions Technical Design Guides. Right now, there's over 50 of them. Today, we're looking at number 50. And then on the bottom here, you can also see the Mid-Rise Advisory Partnership. So if you've got any projects that you're unsure if timber is suitable for, we can, on our team, have a look from a structural point of view, costing, fire, and whatnot, and comments on the feasibility. Okay, so for today's presentation, we're going to go through a little bit about the context for structural engineers in general and how it applies for timber and how timber can be part of your design toolkit as an engineer. Following that, we're going through a very important topic, the timber first uh, paradigm, what you need to design for. One of the things that we always get coming across our desk is buildings that are designed originally as concrete buildings and then we're asked to try and fit a timber building into the concrete kind of depths and structure and layout and it's a bit like fitting a square peg into a round hole. So we'll look at what the timber first kind of design principles really look like. And then we'll go through the engineering design guide uh, contents pages and then through some of the juicy information, keeping in mind that Nick Hewson uh, will be doing a webinar and presentation on design guide uh, 50 appendix two and John Shanks will be doing it on appendix one for the light frame. For a bit of context, in 2016, there were national construction code changes, which isn't news to everybody, but this was a vote of confidence from the NCC. And this allowed for mid-rise timber buildings up until 25 meters be built uh, using a DTS cookbook kind of approach. And in 2019, the recent construction code changes, this is extended to all building classes up until the same height with the same requirements in buildings. So for the DTS approvals, the way we do that is through good detailing based on research. So things like two layers of 30 millimeter plaster board are followed by, so that'll get you to the, the, the 90 minutes required. And then also fail safe at sprinklers and non-combustible insulation and then uh, cavity barriers in between rooms. So that's the way to get it and no timber is going to be exposed down this path. And this is really the cookbook, cookbook, cookie cutter kind of approach to design. Now, the other solution is using the performance solution. And this is where it gets much more interesting for structural engineers because fire design comes part of, of your overall structural design. And we do have technical design guides here, as you can see, 17, 18, 19, and also 37, which looks at the performance solution. So for engineers out there, the way you do that is through uh, the utilizing the structural timber after charring has occurred. So timber does burn at quite a predictable rate. And as you can see here, this char layer forms an insulating layer to the fresh, the fresh part of the timber. So what can happen, but cannot be re relied upon for a fire engineer is self extinguishment, self extinguishment can occur in timber because of this, but you never design that as a structural engineer or you never assume that you'd always assume the worst case scenario. And typically we recommend that the char rates is something that should be given from the supplier uh, first and foremost based on testing and then perhaps looking at uh, different codes for char rates and then it might be prudent for the engineer to choose the most prudent char rates for them to actually design from. So it's also important to note that the, the, the charring is just one element within the fire design. There's a whole structure that other elements go and in contribute to the risk. So the height of the building, the, the egress and the access to staircases and the response time of the fire brigade, the risk of the buildings around, surrounding it and, and all these kind of things. So they all plug into this one long complex risk equation to uh, do the performance-based design. <clears throat> 
So that's from the coast. But if you look at it from a sustainability point of view, and this is something that is going to make the trend stronger and stronger for timber going forward. And on the bottom left-hand side of the, the screen here, what you can see is uh, is the the trend of the proportion of of uh, carbon impacts that come from embodied carbon versus operating carbon. So traditionally, you've got most of your your impacts from an environmental point of view coming from your operating carbon, which is your operational energy, the energy you're you're procuring to the grid, and 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 things like that. But what we're seeing over time, as our building codes are becoming more energy efficient, also as our electricity grids eventually going to come greener, that means the impacts that are left over are all in the embodied carbon space, and it's going to hit a point where the embodied carbon is greater than the operating carbon which is pretty exciting from an engineering point of view because it means that the engineer is going to have the greatest advantage or the greatest leverage on the sustainability of the design of our projects. So looking at traditional materials like cement, if you just look at the chemical reaction, you have limestone plus heat and the chemical reaction is lime and then CO2. Similar thing with steel, you get iron oxide out of the ground, mix it with some carbon and some heat in the reaction and what you're left is pure iron for steel and again, CO2. What, what this means is it doesn't matter how much we optimize this process of these turning these raw materials into structural products, there's always going to be this minimum theoretical limit of CO2 that's emitted basically no matter what. And together at the moment, these are contributing to over 10% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And there's different bodies like the Green Building Council of Australia who are starting to look at embodied carbon much more seriously. So in future, this is what they're talking about currently uh, in their future focus tool, which they release uh, earlier for comment, earlier in the year for comment, they're saying five-star buildings need a 10% embodied carbon reduction. All six-star across the board, you need 20% embodied carbon reduction. And there's already talk of making this a bit more ambitious and pushing towards 40%. And what this means is that uh, if the other materials can't get to 40% in body carbon reduction and eventually when it gets to 100% in body carbon reduction, that means that the only way it can be achieved through some materials is through offsets. I mean, they have to pay to plant trees or do some kind of project around the world or new renewable energy projects to offset the emissions in that. So the, the cost balance is going to shift as well in favor of timber. So when we're using timber, what we're doing is flipping this chemical reaction on its head. On its head, uh, the carbon dioxide—it's on the left-hand side of the equation here, locking it in our structure, mixing it with water and sunlight to release oxygen and sugar. So the chemical reaction—you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see the difference here. And if you think about our our carbon targets by 2050, the writing's on the wall that that this is going to be a serious part of our toolkit to actually get to embodied carbon uh, numbers that we need to by 2050 for our buildings. So look at building codes, sustainability. Now productivity is also another big driver. You can see here different robots and whatnot. Uh, this, is, this isn't science fiction anymore. This is actually happening right now at some factories in Australia. You've got Timber Trust out in Geelong who have got these zero labor kind of kind of robotic arms doing it. And what we're seeing is timber is an enabler of productivity. It's not just productive itself. It's something that if you do the right steps, you can have a much more productive build and obviously get the cost savings. What we're seeing is a structural completion rate of, of 50% faster than that of a reinforced concrete equivalent and the total project program 30% less. And the fourth driver is the health and well-being. This is especially for exposed timber buildings. What we're finding is that uh, there's a higher level of satisfaction, concentration, mood and productivity due to biophilic design. I mean, we did design or we did evolve in accordance with nature. And whenever we do design that brings us back to our roots, it has a good, it has a net positive impact on our psychology. And this is, this can be, contributing to a developer's or a building owner's uh, property line by improved concentration and productivity, less sick leave and things like that. 
So put all this together, timber is gaining in popularity. And what we're finding is engineers out there are becoming more and more aware on how to design this product. A few years ago, there was just a handful of engineers who could do it. Over time, there is a whole bunch now. And it's getting to the point where the engineers who don't have this as one of the part of their skill set might not be considered for jobs because the, the best developers out there, they want to know at least you can consider the building material that is sustainable and renewable. So that's a bit of a context. Now we're going to look at the timber first paradigm, understanding that everyone watching this now isn't, isn't going to be necessarily engineers. So I'll, I'll look at the structure from a for the engineers and everyone else watching this webinar point of view. And I'd like to start by just showing you the difference between concrete and timber because you can't design a concrete builder building and then just straight up expect timber just to fit that. It just doesn't work like that way. The structure does behave differently inherently. So if you look at concrete, say an apartment building, you've got a flat plate slab, usually about 200 thick and you get two-way action with post tensioning. And what that means is you can increase the load and then the tensioning pushes and pulls opposites what the load is and then you get a, a much reduced tension loads within the, the actual concrete slab. What this means is you can get spans of about seven to eight meters going in both directions. And throughout the building, you can kind of drop columns just in, in spots and there doesn't need to be much wall alignment within the building whatsoever. When we're looking at timber, yes, this is something that can, can span two-way, but not in the same way that concrete does. So you can see the outer layers here. Uh, that is where all the strength is coming from. So looking at this direction, this would be spanning this way if you can see my cursor. And the top, middle, and bottom layers are contributing all the strength and stiffness that you possibly need in this direction. If you look at the other direction, which is perpendicular going this way, we've only got two layers here contributing to the overall strength and stiffness. So that means the primary direction is going to be performed much better. So concrete, we get seven, eight meters both directions. With timber, the primary direction is going to be much better than the secondary direction. So as a rule of thumb, the secondary is going to be less than half the primary span, uh, you know, at least. But in general, if you're looking to keep all your timber products as, as open to be used in your project, I think timber is generally to be considered a one-way spanning material. And that way you can get all the different products like your floor trusses and your big floor LVL floor cassettes and whatnot. So concrete, it is a two-way system. Timber, typically one-way, but can be two-way if you really need. And this means for timber, we really need to be looking at utilizing the entire walls for our project. For concrete, not so critical. So as a framework for, for what we think is the most, gonna get your best odds of a very successful project, and uh, in most cases, if you do these things and you design a certain way, you can get much more cost competitive or, or under the concrete price with no compromise on quality. So we recommend spans of about three to six meters. These are typically the most competitive with concrete. When you start going outside this range, that means we're going to get deeper sections than the concrete equivalent. Three to six meters, you, you really are competing with that 200 flat plate slab. We recommend you avoid transfers wherever you can. Whenever you have a transfer somewhere and you've got a one-way system, it's much more difficult to frame out to get that transfer back into our load path. And where you can, uncomplicated uh, floor plates in general for apartment buildings. And there's been some projects or a builder very successful in Victoria here, Figurehead. And this is exactly what they've been doing. This is the old layer apartments. And you can see here they're spanning under six meters in between apartments and they're not utilizing the internal load bearing walls here. And what this means is the internal load bearing walls, you don't need the extra plasterboard and fire rating in the PowerPoints. 
uh, you can just simply go to there to there and that we've found as being a very efficient solution for the, the way to span these buildings. And it's the same up the way, way up the building. So no transfers, spans are within three to six meters and a relatively simple design. And as you can see, the building is still beautiful and has some balconies and whatnot. And we get our large cost savings that some developers are really, really after. So in the design phase of your project, there's two ways you can go about it. You can start with a structural system and then start playing with the architecture around that. Or you can start with the architecture and apply the optimization later on. We think it's probably a combination of both, but you can't, well, we, we highly recommend you don't pay no attention to this timber system. You need to keep the timber system in mind as much as you can, especially early in the project. So that was looking at apartment buildings. Now we're going to look at office buildings and particularly the framing. So again, there's two different options. Option one is you can have a mass timber building and office buildings are typically mass timber. And a nine by nine meter grid is something that can go from the upper levels all the way down and meet the car park grids. If you think of this, it's there's no transfers throughout the building because you're maintaining the grid all the way down. The other thing we're seeing in the marketplace is nine by six meter grids. And again, you've got mass timber on the upper floors. And for the mass timber component, nine by six is much simpler than the nine by nine meter grid, which is a positive. But you're also introducing a transfer level typically to get back to those car park grids of nine by nine. And then with that, you'd have a concrete at the, at the ground floor and then the basement deck also. So this is what we typically see and I'll show you what the frames could look like. So 25 King Street, that's a nine by six meter grid. And you can see it's been done very well because you've got the primary beams spanning the nine meters. And these themselves, they get quite deep. They're, you know, in, in the order of 800 to 1,000 deep. And then you've got the CLT, which basically just sits on top in this case, and that's much thinner. And when you've got a deep, deep primary beam and a thinner floor slab, you've got a good a really good services zone to run all your services through without penetrations. So penetrations sometimes do dictate the overall structural design of our buildings. And you can see here, this is how they've really orientated their primary beam. So you've got nine meters, nine meter grid. And then at the very end, they've got a shorter grid with a much shallower beam. And that way they can run the services all the way back and get it back to the core uh, and this is a very simple, very simple design from an engineering point of view and very simple to build from a builder's point of view. So nine by nine meter grid has also been done quite a few times. Uh, sorry, this is probably the only time at the moment the nine by nine meter grid has been done in Australia. And you can see here, it's a similar thing. We've got the nine meter spanning one direction and then in the secondary direction, what they've done is utilized band beams for this particular project. So you've still got your, your deep nine meter beam, but it's in that secondary floor section, we want to get shallow as possible. So we've got a, got a very good services, services zone to run. And that secondary direction, that secondary nine meter span is becoming more achievable because there's getting much more innovative options from the supply chain. You can see here, the first option, we've got CLT sitting on top of glue lamb ribs. And you can get composite action, so it's acting as one section with screws and also glue. Or in the case of Lendlease, what they've done here is utilizing band beams um, to go in the secondary direction. Or you can also use LVL cassettes. LVL, it's got all the material spanning in one direction. So... Uh, that way it gets that nine meter section and you're looking at 400 to 500 deep, nothing too crazy. And again, we can get that good, good area to run your services through. 
Now I'll look at the actual structural engineering design guide. Now we've covered through the Timber First paradigm. Some of that is covered throughout the engineering design guide, but that's some high level framing advice. So in the structural engineering design guide, the reason we, we wrote this document is we're getting these key questions which you might have sitting at home watching this. Everyone's asking what stands do I use? What are the performance requirements? And just basically how do I design these buildings? So what we've given is a state-of-the-art design procedures for all Australian engineers. We're leaning on AS 1720 part one as much as possible, but then we're going internationally with the best practice design methods wherever required. So the people on the screen here are all contributing to this huge design guide, which has been released late last year. And it was, uh, had a review team consisting of some of the, the leading experts around Australia, both in concrete and both in timber. So looking at the introduction, these products might be similar to you from previous rate, from previous presentations you might have come across. We've got studs and plates, joists and trusses, which are lightweight materials. We've got glue lamp, CLT and LVL, which are typically considered mass timber. So as an engineer, quite interestingly, the most effective system you might use is your class one construction, stud type construction. In Canada and the US, this is the most common type of construction for say three, four, five, six story buildings. Uh, in Australia, it's obviously concrete. And the reason they do it in, in North America, is for a reason, they get better cost savings. <coughs> so at the top of the building, You'd have your traditional one to two story class one construction. As you go down, we're utilizing higher grade studs, things like LVL with higher compressive strengths, and then also increase the depth of the stud and then also the number of studs that are sitting next to each other. Cross laminated timber is a great engineered product. It's got, it's got two way action. So, uh, as I said earlier, the, 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 there's grain going in both directions and that means you can use it as a diaphragm. So diaphragm being something that transfers lateral loads back to the core um, from both directions. And we've got LVL, laminated veneer lumber. If you think about CLT, that's got grain going in both directions and sometimes that secondary direction isn't always necessary. But for LVL, the grains going in one direction. So this is the most efficient use of material for a one way spanning system. And that's why it's got the highest strength to stiffness ratio of, of the engineered timber products. One of the things you need to consider when you're moving to designing with timber is the manufacturing of the product. So if you've got just a blank panel, like you can see on the top here, and there's one perimeter cut, that's going to cost very different to something that has a lot of CNC work and, and routing and whatnot. So for concrete, you're looking at the cost per meters cube typically. When we're going to timber, it's not just the cost per meters cube. It's actually also the CNC machine, CNC machine time you're taking up. <coughs> And it's also important to look at the buildability. So that's inside the factory. Now we're taking the panel to site. If you look at this top panel, it's CNC three holes out of it. These are probably wastage in the middle, so it's not good from a wastage point of view. But you take the site, you lift it up, and you install it in one lift. The bottom here, a lot more CNC work required, but there's no material waste. You could probably stack better on a container because there's less gaps and less air. But when you get to site again, you're, uh, you're lifting multiple times more than the one. So given that the lifting times is the critical path for our projects, then this may not be the most appropriate for this, per per this one example. So from a prefabrication point of view, we can move from nodes, which are your connections, your stick frame, your panel 2D, and right now, inside the factory, you can go from something that's just got the structure all the way to fully finished wall systems. 
right, which is pretty amazing, adding to the productivity on site. Then all the way now to 3D modular, which we're seeing more and more of bathroom pods, for example, in some of our timber projects. Okay, now looking at floor design. So light frame floor design for mid-rise timber buildings can be designed similarly to your class one buildings because the floors are the same spans, if you think about it, typically, it can be designed in the same kind of way. And that means the design and documentation is typically by the truss and frame manufacturers for floor trusses in these taller buildings. Uh, what, uh, what usually governs for timber buildings is the dynamic vibration check. So when you're walking and you can feel the vibration of the next, of the next room. Looking at light frame wall design, again, we recommend 1720 part one as you would your class one uh, buildings. And this is, this is also applicable for these taller buildings and you just increase the size of studs and the, and the depth and reduce the spacing. And this is outlined in the design guide. Now CLT design, it's a little bit different. It means you be designed for deflection, bending, shear, vibration, performance. But the big thing is really design standards. So for the lightweight systems, we can rely on 1720 part one. There's nothing too innovative in that sense. When we're using CLT, the design standard we recommend engineers should be using is based on where they actually source the CLT. So getting in touch with the supplier in this case is very important early. And it's always gonna be cash 22 because some projects they'd rather not be locked in too early, but at the same time, the supplier's got loads of value to be adding for your project. So if you're getting your design, if you're getting your product from Australia, so <clears throat> at the moment it's XLAM, there's also Timberlink, which is going online in a few years' time, and then also uh, CLTP, which is another CLT manufacturer. So there's quite a few now in Australia who are popping up. And the way to do this, you can use 1720 part one, but with a combination of manufacturer literature. So the, the, the capacity factors and the things that take into account the moisture and the region and the temperature and everything like that and the bearing factors, they can all be applied for CLT, but there's a few engineering transformations which need to be made, which I'll get into. European product, you can use 1170, so Australian standards for the loading side of the equation, but we recommend that you use the, the same design code as Europe, which is Eurocode or EC5 to work out the capacities because that's where they get their material from. That's the most prudent way to do it. North America, you can use, again, Australian standards for the loading, our loading here but then the design and the strength needs to be designed based on North American standards. What's really important, you can't just chop and change uh, standards here. You need to stick one and then go with it the whole time. So in the design guide we've got, we've got all the different methods that's been shown uh, based on all the different methods around the world here. So it's real, real smorgasbord of, of engineering strategies that's contained in the guide. So the biggest difference with CLT compared to all the other products is rolling shear. So what happens if you think of CLT panel, if you put load on it, the, the individual board layers will start sliding past one another a little bit. And what you're looking to do is in a perfect world, you'd have that sliding less, uh, less than 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 uh, you'd, you'd like and this can typically be taken into account by something called the gamma factor for engineers and what this means is if gamma is zero that means when your the boards are sliding there's no connection between layers so it's basically the same as having three layers of three board panels just sitting on top of each other Right, they just slide past one another and they're not helping each other out to give you the strength. Up the top, if you've got all the, 
individual layers connected to each other through the right glue performance, that means you can get it as one single solid system carrying a load. But typically what we see is that you're not going to get perfection and it's not going to be zero. The glue is going to give you about 80% up to 99% uh, strength in, in the composite action between the board layers. So we have spoken a little bit about manufacturing, but engineering is also, the engineers really need to look at it from a system point of view also. So what this means is, uh, there's acoustic requirements that need to be met and the structure is going to be part of the overall acoustic and fire solution. And you can see here for total depth of floor systems, so for timber frame, you can look up to about 400. Concrete was 350 and you can get something similar from a timber frame store floor or mass timber, again, provided that the spans are something that is quite reasonable. For floor design, when we're looking at balconies, there's three different types of balconies. So you've got self-supported balcony structures. So you've got posts at the end. And I think in this image, it's steel posts here. You've got cantilevered balconies coming out. And cantilevered balconies might be a bit more difficult because if you think there's a support there, and what might happen is that the CLT might deflect or the timber might deflect upwards, meaning there's going to be water dripping in the wrong direction. So designers need to look at things like increasing the amount of fall that's appropriate to reduce the, the moisture. And the third we've got here is inserting a balcony into wall. So as you can see, when, it in, when you look at durability in the previous presentations, uh, the most important thing to keep our buildings safe and long lasting and reaching at least your 50 year design service life is to minimize the moisture and detail in such ways that, that each of the moisture is not going to impact our timber and not puddle anywhere and whatnot. So that means we need things like drainage. You might you might uh, get appropriate drainage and use your falls to direct in certain ways. You might use durable species. Um, you might deflect the water away and, and so forth. So there's different ways you can do it, but this is a really important thing for engineers to get right. Okay, so that was floor design. Now we'll look at wall design. So as I was showing earlier, different systems. You've got lightweight, partially enclosed. You can go fully enclosed, ready to go on site, and a mass panel wall system. So there's different ways of constructing it and which have different implications. So particularly in Canada, you can do a platform framing so you get the floor system to go span through and then sit on top of the stud and then the stud just sits right on top. You've got semi-balloon framing where the stud runs all the way through and then you've got balloon framing completely which is similar, uh, similar in a sense. So the difference here is here we've got the low path going through the floor system which is perpendicular grain which uh, and it's important to note that perpendicular grain is, is weaker than the longitudinal grain. So what we're basically doing here is we're squashing the floor system and at higher loads, this could be an issue. So if you get higher and higher loads, you might have to start looking at semi-balloon and balloon framing. So timber frame in the design guide will show you that it can be designed uh, in certain ways. And what we typically can use is the lining which is the bracing, which is the is going to help in your in your horizontal loads for your building. That's going to restrain the buckling in the minor axes. So this lining that gets put on inside the factory is going to stop the the timber from buckling outwards. But then you've also got your minor your your major axes might buckle. Another design check is your bearing capacity, which can be found in the guide. And that's looking at timber frame systems. So CLT wall systems, as you can see in this image here, the external layers are parallel to the grain. They're carrying all the wall load. This middle layer here, that's not going in directional load, so it's not carrying any of the vertical load. 
However, this middle layer, it might be used over a door opening or act as a lintel beam if, if necessary. So this middle layer isn't necessarily always completely useless. So it's a similar thing. It needs to be designed for combined actions, which is, which means if you put a load here, so say if that's our wall panel, if we put a load on the edge here, it's going to want to want to want to buckle out. So it needs to be designed for bending and axial load. No different to concrete and steel. Another design check for engineers is the bearing capacity. So as the load goes through this wall and it, as it goes through this floor section. The, the floor section needs to check that it can carry the load in between the wall above and below. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a bit of vertical movement. And again, this is a very important factor. So timber being a, a biological uh, material, it does move at predictable amounts, which the engineers need to be across. So shortening, there's, there's different elements that contribute to shortening, which I'll go through now. So you've got the joints. So when the timber is cut inside the factory, there's going to be a tiny gap that closes when the building puts load on it. So you can see here, there's one joint, two joints. So there's two joints per floor here. We've got, we got compression in the longitudinal. So when we put load on our wall panel, the load's going to squish it a little bit. And you got shrinkage of the wall panel as well. So shrinkage is when it releases water. So if it's delivered to site at a certain moisture content uh, and the room's less than that, over time it's going to release that water out and shrink and shorten as well. So that's for the wall panel. Looking at the floor panel, similar thing. We got the load going through this floor panel and the floor panel is going to act differently, shortening performance compared to the wall panel because again remember the the floor panel perpendicular grain so when the, the when the load's going to a perpendicular grain it squishes a lot more than longitudinal grain if you think about a tree like the way a tree evolves it's got all the strength going upwards but trees didn't evolve to have much strength putting load uh, in that perpendicular direction so we need to keep that in mind when we design our buildings so you've got, yeah, load and then also shrinkage perpendicular to grain. And then, of course, you've got the settlement and the, def and the deflection of the transfer structure if you're using a transfer structure. And there's different ways that moisture content can be controlled. So remember, there was shrinkage in both the perpendicular floor panel and also the, the parallel grain wall panel. Both of them, when they release water, they shrink so the way to do that is to simply control the moisture content one you can make sure the water is released as much as possible before you install it and the way to do that is you can wrap your timber on site and make sure you're controlling the amount of moisture that's going inside the timber uh, we think that that shortening is one issue but from a durability point of view you don't want moisture contents going to, to you know above 20 percent from a durability point of view, you might be having some problems down the track. Another thing you can do is you can increase the grade of your products that are in the load path. Or you can minimize the perpendicular grain. So at certain details, remember I was saying that if the tree's on its side, it never evolved like that. So it's not going to take load as well. Uh, we want to optimize our load path as the load goes down the building to have as much parallel grain parallel grain taking it as, as we possibly can. Another way to reduce the overall vertical movement is to minimize the concentrated stress throughout our building. So if you think about it, if you're an LVL stud, which is very strong, you know, up to about 50 MPA, so very strong material here, We've got a lot of load going through a very thin kind of frame and thin part of the building. As we move up and use lower grade material, something like MGP-10, there's much greater area for our load to travel through. And then we're looking at CLT. Again, it's another step change in the amount of, of, of uh, area that our load is traveling through. So five times difference between an LVL and a CLT 
wall panel, for example. And what that means is, remember the building movement happens because of compression deformation, so the, the load and also the water. So for the compression deformation, typically for CLT walls, it is much, much less than for light frame buildings. And you see the difference in percentages here. For mass timber, there's more shortening from the water that's being leaving the panel. For lightweight framing, it's more from the deformation and the loads that are put are applied to our panels. So the, the, the final solution we can do to minimize shortening in the building is just removing the perpendicular grain from our load path altogether. This has been done overseas, so you can see this used to be the world's tallest timber building, 18 stories of, of timber, so it's called Brock Commons. And what they're using is a post and plate system, so posts and two-way action of the CLT slab. And because it's very highly concentrated loads, what they've done is use a steel stub column basically to transfer the loads and skip the perpendicular grain altogether. Another important thing for engineers to consider is designing with other materials. So steel, for example, you've got steel balconies, understanding that that doesn't shrink like, like timber does, but it might move for different, re different reasons. And in this case, if it isn't taken into account, the fall to the, who's going back to the building. So you might need to design with an exaggerated fall or use screed or some kind of floor build up to get it the other way. Using flashing, when necessary to deflect all water from our timber. And on the third option here, again, this is Brock Common. So they're using a concrete core here. And it's, it's important to understand the, the movement characteristics of concrete versus timber, especially because timber is prefabricated into millimeter precision. It needs to be perfect when it needs to get on site. So next we'll look at lateral load resistance of our buildings. So concrete buildings typically can be continuous. That means you get uh, you get a core and then you get your shear connectors in between the walls and that means the core acts as one big solid core going up the building providing a lot of stiffness. With timber, it's much more difficult to get that same level of composite action to act as a full entire core by itself. With timber, typically it's designed as individual individual walls to provide its stiffness. So that means we're not getting our stiffness from cores like we are from concrete, typically. So as we go up and taller and taller buildings, what we're seeing is glue lamp bracing, for example, is, is providing most lateral stiffness. So it's basically working as a floor truss that goes from the bottom of the, the floor all the way upwards and in both directions. So you can see they're typically using two bays of, of bracing per, uh, per direction. And not only that, it can look pretty beautiful as well with it exposed glazing. It can be an architectural feature. So CLT, it gets most of its stiffness from rod expansion and uh, this is where it's different to concrete. So for concrete, all the stiffness is coming from the thickness of the walls. When we're looking at CLT, it's a combination of the, the actual wall, the timber, and also the connections. So you can see here the shear connectors are moving and sliding across. And then also you've got the rod expansion, so the tensile connector as it moves up. So these two connections are making our building move more so than this movement. These uh, and that's bending deformation within the panel and shear deformation within the panel. So that might sound complex and engineering-y, but the one takeaway really is that for timber buildings, the stiffness comes from the connections. For concrete buildings, the stiffness comes from the thickness of the wall. So that's fundamentally two, two differences. There's a similar thing when it comes to your timber frame panel. So this is your lightweight uh, wall frames. And again, it's the connections, the screws and the nails back in is, is providing most of the stiffness. 
So it's in the diaphragm. So if uh, you haven't come across the concept of diaphragms before, these are the things that take the lateral load as the building gets pushed through the floor panel. It transfers the loads back to the lateral stability system, where it be the, the bracing like we saw earlier or individual shear walls. So in the code, you, can, you did see it's discontinuous construction, um, which means we need a gap in between inter-party walls. But at the same time, uh, as an engineer, what they'll be looking to do is using the diaphragm to run all the way through continuous. And this is a conversation to be had between the acoustic consultant and the structural engineer to make sure you're achieving the intent of the building code and getting, getting the required acoustic requirements. At the same time, making sure we're getting a floor system to transfer the load in between apartments. So now as we move to the end, so in the design guide for engineers, we've got appendix one. This is a worth example for a timber frame apartment building and a similar thing for appendix two for CLT. So I highly recommend that you download this guide and check out more of it yourself to learn more about how to design with timber. To access this, you go to woodsolutions.com.au. We've got over 51 design guides right now. Before I go, just a quick plug of the Wood Solutions Timber Talks podcast. You can see on the top left here, we've got Ho Ho Vienna, which is the world's tallest timber building, we've got the world's tallest uh, timber office building, we've got the world's uh, most innovative building extension, and we've got Dairy House. And, uh, so we've got basically all the best timber design case studies from around the world and basically you can just sit as a fly on the wall to listen to these the project teams in these projects talk about all sorts of things what made their project a success and some of our guests include people like michael marx who's the ex-ceo of tesla and uh founder of katera all the way through to michael green from michael green architecture and google own sidewalk labs So thank you very much, everyone, for taking uh, your time to listen to this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you have a great end of your day.